Okay, it's 12 o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Hey, everybody, I'm Matt Wellington. I'm the Associate Director of Maine Public Health Association, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. And welcome to our fourth and final installment of our webinar series, Cannabis in Maine Public Health Policy and Impacts. And today we're going to dig into municipal versus state policy on cannabis. And we have two great speakers to help walk us through uh, that topic, who I'll introduce in just a moment. But first, some quick housekeeping items. So here we go. Uh, this project is supported by the Health Resources and Services Administration of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services as part of an award to the public health training centers. And as such, the contents of the authors here don't necessarily re reflect the official views of or endorsement by HRSA, HHS, or the U.S. government. You can receive continuing education credits for this webinar uh, by following the prompt in this link, which I'll also share in the chat. Just make sure that you choose Cannabis in Maine from the drop-down menu uh, to receive those credits. And a big thanks to our partners and co-sponsors for the webinar series. So, of course, Maine Public Health Association and our Alcohol, Tobacco, and Other Drugs member section help to organize the series alongside Maine Medical Association, Maine Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the New England Public Health Training Center. So thank you to our partners for helping put this together and helping to promote it. And for the Q&A section of today's webinar, um, everybody's on mute and is off video. There will be a live Q&A uh, section of today's discussion. And when we get to that point, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Um, don't use the chat, don't use the hand raise function. And then last thing is that I would love for folks to stay on just a few minutes at the end. Once we get to a few minutes before the top of the hour, I will kick off the poll, which is just four super simple questions about um, the webinar. And that is something that's required for HRSA evaluation. So please stick around and fill out that evaluation. And that brings us to our speakers. So I am very glad to be joined here by Jeanette Lewin. Uh, Partners for Prevention Program Coordinator, or excuse me, Program Director at Westbrook Partners for Prevention, and Rebecca J. Lambert, Municipal Issues Specialist at the Maine Municipal Association. So thank you to you both for joining us today. And to kick us off, our speakers are going to share some remarks and, and presentation uh, based on their issue area and area of expertise, and then we will get into the discussion. So I realized we didn't talk about who would want to go first. Uh, who wants to jump in first? Any preferences, Rebecca or Jeanette? Okay, I see Rebecca speaking. She's on mute, but I think she said I can go first. So Rebecca, over to that you. That is what I said. I, good job reading my lips. <laughs> yeah. Go for it. Okay, so um, is someone else sharing their screen? Oh, there we go. Okay, so I will. Oh, it says that participant screen sharing is disabled. Let me fix that, sorry. Okay, you should be good now. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so basically, uh, as far as municipalities go, uh, they, they operate under the premise that uh, they have home rule, which is that they have the authority to create laws and rules uh, for that would work for the people that live in their, within their borders. So there were two different cannabis laws that were passed. There was the adult use cannabis and then the medical use cannabis. Um, and they, they both are for each uh, section, the adult use and the medical cannabis use. As far as municipalities, opt-in is mandatory. Otherwise, cannabis, um, whether it's medical or adult use, um, is prohibited. So the legislative body of, in that town, whether it's the select board of the town council, will need to allow an opt-in to allow these establishments. There are a couple caveats that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but and generally speaking, uh, the municipality will need to opt in to each type of cannabis business, whether it be cultivation, retail stores, manufacturing, and testing facilities. Otherwise, it's prohibited. So the types of cannabis businesses that are allowed are for the adult use, the retail stores, cultivation facilities, manufacturing, and testing facilities. And in the medical side, it gets a little bit more tricky. Um, there's caregiver retail stores, 
um, but not registered caregivers in general. It's their stores. Uh, registered dispensaries are also allowed and need to be opted into, uh, manufacturing and testing facilities. And as I mentioned, there are a few issues regarding the medical side. Um, there's no local opt-in for cultivation or manufacturing for vertically integrated registered caregivers. And what that means is that a registered caregiver can grow their cannabis, they can process it and manufacture it, and then they can sell it. So for those vertically integrated registered caregivers, they don't need to have municipal opt-in. Um, also, if they were if they were in operation with municipal approval before December 13th, 2018, then they still will be allowed to operate. There's a little bit of a gray area there. Um, there's also trouble defining caregiver retail stores. And that is um, not, it's different than a, a dispensary that you would see for medical cannabis. It's for a registered caregiver who sells to their own patients um, whether it be out of their house or out of an office building. Um, so there's a little bit of ambiguity in defining those retail caregiver stores. Um, another issue that has come up is the grandfathered retail stores. As I was mentioning before, any uh, caregiver retail store that was operating with municipal approval before 2018 can still be operating um, and are grandfathered into the program. Um, and another issue that seems to be coming up is um, the information about caregivers is confidential in the Office of Cannabis Policy, and um, municipalities would like to see a little bit more sharing of that information because they have no way of knowing whether a um, registered caregiver or just a caregiver is growing legally or not, and if they're registered with the state of Maine. Um, so, however, caregivers, understandably, also are concerned that this, um, if this information is given to municipalities, it does become subject to FOIA. And that could end up creating unintentionally a hit list of people with that are growing marijuana, um, cannabis or processing it, or just have either cash or cannabis product on hand at their homes and making it um, a target for people who would like to, to steal that. Um, so those are some issues. So as far as municipal regulation, um, on the adult use side, municipalities can regulate stores, cultivation facilities, manufacturing facilities, and testing facilities. Um, they cannot prohibit license or zone home cultivation, personal use cultivation. Um, and they cannot regulate personal use or possession but they can limit the number of plants on one parcel for home cultivation. So for example, you have five people living in a home and each person over 21 years of age can grow six plants. So you can have a, a municipality can say that on one parcel of land, um, so that would be what, 35 plants, they can only have 20 plants on one parcel. So you can limit that, but you can't limit um, people, you can't restrict people from growing. On the medical side, um, you can regulate registered caregiver stores, dispensaries, manufacturing and testing facilities, um, and you can regulate registered caregiver medical cannabis activity. For, for that, um, for example, in Wyndham, uh, for their registered caregivers or can caregivers that are operating out of their homes, they um, they regulate those as home businesses so that they are in a way captured under this. Um, one thing that municipalities cannot do on the medical side is to prohibit or limit the number of caregivers that they have in their municipality. Um, and they can't regulate patients or unregistered caregivers or personal use or possession by, by patients. So if your municipality has opted in to any of these, there are certain things that you can do um, to, to help with the regulation. You can, if you don't have a comp, comp plan, um, you can still use ordinances to um, 
create safe zones around schools because you can't prevent uh, delivery of adult use cannabis into your municipality, but you can designate that it can only be done in these certain zones within your municipality. Um, it's very important to have distinct regulations between your adult use and your medical use. That way it's very clear and there's no question. Um, as I stated, delivery cannot be prohibited, but it can be regulated by your, by your ordinances. Um, site plan reviews for setbacks, odor control, performance standards, and business licensing fees. Um, one thing to mention that there is uh, money available through OCP in the municipal, uh, municipal opt-in fund to recoup some of the costs that it has cost municipalities up to $20,000 um, to opt into cannabis operations. Um, so that, that definitely is out there and you should look into it if you're eligible for that. Um, but as far as charging licensing fees for municipalities, they have to be in related to what it costs the municipality to opt in for um, staff fees or um, attorney fees uh, for reviewing ordinances and that sort of thing. Um, and then I just, I included some contact information. The Office of Cannabis Policy is a great resource uh, if you have any questions about uh, licensing or compliance. And um, MMA members are encouraged to contact our legal department with any questions. And we also have guidance documents related to cannabis on our, on our website. Um, and I, I'm happy to answer any questions or connect you with someone that is able to help you further if you need. So my contact information is there as well. Awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, super helpful. And I definitely have some follow-up questions to, to chime in with once we get into the discussion. I would also just encourage people to check out the previous webinar in the series, which was around, um, it featured Gabby Pierce from the Office of Cannabis Policy. She gave a, a bigger overview as well on the medical versus adult use. So if you want some more context, check out that webinar. Jeanette, over to you. Could you enable my screen sharing? I absolutely can. You would think that on the fourth and final webinar, I would have been able to do that in advance, but here we are. Okay. Should be good to go. Great. Thank you. Great. So um, for... Really, the public health perspective, um, when we discuss cannabis in municipalities and opting in, um, there's a lot of things that we can do, even if, you know, um, cannabis use is legal for medical reasons, for adult use, um, a lot of different municipalities have opted in, but um, we know that about 90 or so have currently opted in. Um, and that's not the majority, right? So there's still about 400 or so, a little under 400 municipalities in Maine that have chosen not to opt in. Um, and municipalities can also opt in. Uh, they don't have to opt in to <clears throat> all of these. They can choose a part of uh, one or two or three or four. So when we talk about really the adult use part, um, people like a municipality can just opt into retail or growing um, or none of them. So it really varies um, municipality to municipality. And it's this is just a great opportunity to provide education. Um, so with um, opting in, you know, it has to be a municipality has to either vote like a town council or select board, or they have to put this to a ballot measure. And as a public health professional, you can really, you can reach out to those municipalities and local lawmakers um, to be known. You know, we want to make sure that we're really focusing on education, not advocacy, not saying, you know, you shouldn't opt in or trying to influence any sort of laws um, or decisions. But really having a clear presence as a public health professional, as an expert in that community. Um, I work in Westbrook um, and I work for a DFC, so a drug-free community grant. Um, and there's a lot of those dispersed throughout the state. And some folks, you know, might work for just 
uh, cover one municipality and some uh, have a uh, service area that covers two or three or four or five. So really becoming familiar with that municipality in your service area, uh, building those relationships, whether it's holding town halls or even inviting local lawmakers to coalition meetings or to be a part of one's coalition. Um, being really prepared and prepare and planning ahead for meetings. So bringing any like relevant printouts. Um, and it's important to share stories and data. I think there's a lot of things that, you know, we can share successes and failures um, from other areas, whether it's other municipalities in Maine or other states in the country. Um, and being really important too is to be consistent and credible. So not trying to really sway any votes or, or lobby again. So uh, for the folks who are in this, this is these information you probably already know if you work in public health, um, especially if you receive any federal grant funding, um, we can't really use federal money to impact legislation. So if this is something that someone feels really passionately, you know, in their off time, um, not during the workday, they could definitely do some advocacy work, but during work hours, it's really more focused on education. So things that we can do as public health professionals are really, you know, focusing on the data aspects, sharing local, state, national data, presenting facts, answering questions, um, really being concise too. I know a lot of times, if someone is invited to speak to a city council, you only have about three minutes to share any of your points across. Um, and again, really trying not to persuade or encourage a specific side or vote, even if we as public health professionals want to do that, um, and not using any scare tactics or exaggerations, and really not taking it personally. Like, there is a chance that, you know, your municipality decides to opt in, or maybe they don't decide to opt in, but the work doesn't stop if they do decide to opt in. Um, I won't go into too much detail on this. I know some of the other uh, presenters in previous webinars have done a great job of really delving into the youth impact and the health concerns, but making sure that this is something that is presented when talking to local lawmakers in your municipality. So why should we be concerned with the impact of cannabis on, on young people? Really emphasizing the high potency THC, any relevant data you can find too. Um, and employing these public health strategies, uh, which a lot of us are familiar with, um, the, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention Strategies, or CSAP. Um, so information dissemination, education, and alternatives, problem ID and referral, community-based processes, and environmental strategies. And I've just included some of those under education, info dissemination, and environmental. So if let's say a municipality has opted in, you know, as, as a public health um, professional, as a substance use prevention expert, um, there's a lot that we can do either before the opting in too, but after an opting in as well. So helping with the ordinance, sometimes people will ask for input on that. So, you know, some municipalities like Portland is a great one to mention. Um, you know, they've limited the number of licensees and stores. They've set requirements for, um, you know, educating uh, vendors and folks who work um, in adult use stores, regulating pricing. So not, you know, giving product away for free, um, really making sure that these things are labeled appropriately, not attracting young people with you know, bright colors, um, they're appropriately marked. Um, and then building in measures to invest money in prevention. So uh, I know Portland and Wyndham, um, there's a portion of either the licensing fee or um, profits from stores, from sales that actually go into a fund focusing on prevention and education for youth too. Um, other things we can do is, you know, education focusing on um talking to young people at the middle school and high school level, using evidence-based prevention curriculum, 
Um, and then incorporating info dissemination, so public health campaigns, um, reaching out to parents, you know, focusing on safe storage, um, safe use, promoting those types of things through, you know, social media, newsletters, whatever the method may be. Um, and then this is just something I want to highlight briefly. So this is a table from um, the Northern New England Poison Control. And cannabis was legalized in Maine in 2016. And at the very bottom, you can see um, the number of calls related to um, like poison exposures for a variety of different ages. And you can see that following 2016, those numbers have really steadily increased. Um, and 2020 was when the first adult retail stores were opened in Maine. Um, and that has also steadily been increasing. I didn't have the data for 2022 or 2023, but that's just something to highlight too when having conversations with municipalities and um, you know expressing concern about cannabis exposure or poisonings um, and including that in educational efforts too. And then just, uh, I wanted to highlight some helpful resources. So I know Rebecca mentioned the Office of Cannabis Policy. Um, there's some really great information too from CADCA um, and SAM on, you know, having presentations and discussions with lawmakers about cannabis. Um, the Northern New England Poison Control, you can request data for a specific area for the state, whatever um, you're interested in. Um, and then I li also linked Portland's um, cannabis ordinance too, so people can peek at that to see the different um, things they've incorporated. And then this is my contact info. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette, that was great. Um, so I wanted to ask a clarifying question. You mentioned when you were talking, I think about Portland, maybe Wyndham was in there as well, a prevention fund, can you, say a little bit more about that. Is that specific to Portland and, and where does the money come from? I apologize if I missed that part. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, different municipalities can incorporate that into their ordinance however they want to. And sometimes it comes from um, the licensing fee that the municipality requires for the stores to um, submit every year. So it's a percentage of that licensing fee. I believe Portland had done... Um, like 1% of profits from stores, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to double check their ordinance again. But um, yeah, setting aside some money to reinvest into prevention um, is something that people definitely can suggest in the ordinance um, creation process. Um, and it's probably easier to pass some of these measures initially rather than kind of backpedaling and trying to do that you know, two, three, five years down the road after a municipality has already opted in. For sure. And just to flag for folks in the audience, you can uh, submit your questions now through the Q&A function, and I will do my best to direct those to our speakers. Um, so Rebecca, I, I wanted to go to you and ask, and I'll just say, I'm really glad, Jeanette, that you shared the 90 out of 482 towns have opted in. I did not realize that it was not as high maybe as I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but Rebecca, can you share examples of towns that you think have done a really good job? I know good job mm -hmm. is hard to define, but like mm -hmm. that you think have navigated this really well when they've opted in and have used the resources, policies at their disposal to, to do it responsibly. Do you have any examples you can share of towns that have done that? I, I don't know if I have any specific town examples that I can share where they have done it well, but I know that there are several towns that have opted in um, that worked on their ordinances first. And while they were going through that whole process before they opted in, so they had everything ready to go. And I think that's very important to do that ahead of time and to talk to people who have already opted in. And it's probably important to note too that there is no rev revenue sharing with cannabis. If you've opted in, there's there's no revenue that gets generated back to municipalities, which that is something that we're hoping to change in the future. But you know, there there's really not much incentive for municipalities to opt in. Yeah. Right. So, Jeanette, were you going to say something? 
No, I just think that that's, you know, that's one of the myths. I think that's initially when a lot of towns did start opting in and, you know, 2020, um, it was driven by, you know, this economic belief of, you know, where the pandemic is happening and, and we're struggling and, you know, this is going to bring in so much like tax revenue to our city or town. Um, and then, you know, we found out that's actually not the case. Um, but towns can also set their own um, licensing fees too. And that can help bring in some revenue, but it's not, they're not seeing this large windfall that was anticipated at the local level, at least. Yeah. And someone asked in the Q and A, is there a list of the towns that have opted in that's public here in Maine? I believe that's on the OCP website. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be curious to see. And then Rebecca, I'm also curious, has the MMA done any kind of focus groups with the towns that have opted in that want to share their experiences for towns that haven't opted in yet? And, you know, say like, heads up, this is what we experienced that you should keep in mind. Has that been happening through the MMA? Uh, well, MMA does have our legal department will put out guidance documents and opinions on, on you know, sample ordinances and that sort of thing. They do have webinars that they've put out to our members that they can join and our affiliates. Um, or actually, I think anybody can sign up for them. I think there's just a member rate and a non-member rate, but with best practices for municipalities as they navigate the cannabis landscape both medical and adult use. Awesome. So someone asked, what are the requirements to become a caregiver? Um, does Rebecca or Jeanette, do you have the answer to that? If not, I think we did cover it in one of the previous webinars, but anything you'd want to share? I, I don't have anything to yeah. add to that. It's mm -hmm. all that information would be on the OCP website where they are they're in charge of all the caregivers. Yeah. So um, I would encourage that person to visit the OCP website in Maine and also check out the recording of the third webinar, which I will send out with the recording of this one um, shortly after this ends, where Gabby from OCP, I think, did go through what it means to be a caregiver and what those requirements are. Um, so I was curious, Jeanette, you shared the information on poisonings, which I've seen before, and every time it shocks me a bit, just how clear that increase is since legalization. What is What are the policy options for municipalities when it comes to things like safe packaging? You know, how much can municipalities do? And I say safe packaging because I assume that's part of the problem. Um, what can municipal, excuse me, municipalities do for safe packaging? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I think, I mean, on the state level, there are some recommendations too, and, um, you know, different types of, like, um, I want to say logos, but different types of like warning signs that you can use. So if something is, let's say it's a food product, it's, it's not like, it's not a gummy bear. It's, it's made to be like a very plain looking, like a gummy square. Um, it doesn't have like bright coloring. And then it's clearly marked like warning this product contains THC or warning not for children, um, not for consumption of children. And then some um, municipalities have gone a step further and they've required, you know, signage to be present in these different, you know, medical um, or adult retail spaces um, that will encourage, you know, safe storage. So they'll say, you know, if you are purchasing these, make sure you're putting them up in a way where, you know, kids, pets can't access them. Um, that's another interesting data point too, is that um, calls to vets and vet visits have also increased because our, you know, our dogs and cats, they don't ask for permission. They kind of see something on the counter and they go for it. Um, and they can have some negative experiences too with um, consuming cannabis so um, there's definitely is are some guidelines for packaging and and those can be very clearly defined in an ordinance. Um, if a municipality decides to, they can um, incorporate education requirements too. So similarly to how you know we have tips training or responsible beverage server training um, throughout the state for alcohol vendors and retailers. Um, there's some uh, municipalities that have made education requirements for for cannabis establishments too. So I know Portland again does a great job with that. They'll hold monthly workshops um, 
where um, folks that work in places with cannabis retail can come and learn about, you know, proper um, identification and how to identify a fake ID and um, how like different safety practices to encourage and, um, you know, when not to, when to refer someone to like the medical provider um, and things, things of that nature, like focusing on the youth youth impact as well. So I think they have it as like an annual requirement for anyone who's working in um, a cannabis retail place. And that's something that um, municipalities can also consider doing if they opt in. Great. Thanks, Jeanette. So I want to go to another question in the Q&A. So for towns who have opted in for adult use and or medical use, but still have, or sorry, for towns who have not opted in, but still have home delivery, is there any information sharing between municipalities around how many of those deliveries fall outside of the retailer's home-based municipality or location? It's the first part of the question. So I'll pose that to both of you first. <clears throat> I don't believe municipalities can deter can um, limit delivery in municipalities, whether they've opted in or not. Um, they can create safe zones, like delivery can only happen um, in these certain areas. But as far as adult use, and, per, and if, when they're using it for personal use and they're having it delivered to their home, there is no, there is no regulation for that. I haven't heard of that either, but I mean, I think you, a municipality could work with law enforcement to to conduct compliance checks to make sure that's going on the way it's supposed to. I haven't heard of anyone doing that yet, but that is something that could be implemented. Right. And the second part of the question is, is there a push from OCP state and municipalities for responsible cannabis retail retailer trainers specific to home delivery, especially around youth access and potential for accidental ingestion? Sounds like nothing in the works that you know of, but seems like a good of. idea. <laughs> I guess this is what we would say. Right. Um, that would be a great idea though, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I did That'd want to talk a good about- question for OCP. <laughs> good question for OCP, for sure. And I think Gabby might have included her information in the previous webinar if people wanted to follow up. So good flag there. So I wanted to talk about zoning because Rebecca, you just mentioned safe zones. When I drive down the street, route one, I guess it is to, to Bath, there are so many cannabis shops. I think I counted six or seven along that one street. And I've always been curious, is that a result of the town zoning restrictions that they can only be in that section or, or mm -hmm. what? So I'm just curious, how does that work with towns and what are some good examples? You mentioned safe zones around schools. What other ways can towns use zoning to make sure that there's not a, you know, every other storefront on their main street is a cannabis business? Yeah. Um, exactly what you said. Um, they can zone it so that only in certain sections of the town that these businesses are allowed. Um, it can be that um, it is allowed in any, you know, the manufacturing or cultivation can only be done in like the industrial zone or, you know, it can it can be set up however the municipalities best sees fit for, for their residents. Can that happen retroactively? I, I'm just imagining a town in that craze that I can't remember if it was Jeanette or you, Rebecca, who mentioned during COVID, people needed revenue, maybe towns rushed to opt in. Can they do some of this retroactively if they're thinking, oh, we didn't really put enough thought into these parts of it? Is that something they can do after the fact? I would imagine so. They can they can change their ordinance at any time. It just, you have to go through the process. Right. So Jeanette, you, you talked about Westbrook. Can you share some more about how Westbrook has navigated? They have opted in, right? How, mm -hmm. no, they haven't. Westbrook has not opted in. So, um, but you know, a lot of our surrounding and neighboring towns and cities have. So, you know, we border Portland and Portland definitely has opted in. Um, Wyndham, they, you know, driving down route 302, you see a lot of, of um, cannabis, um, stores too. Um, Westbrook did not opt in. Um, you know, we didn't, based on my conversation with, um, you know, our lawmakers here, um, 
I didn't really see a benefit to do so. There, they, you know, there was no real like financial incentive. Um, they didn't really want to increase youth access. And then so many of our neighbors have it. So if people really wanted to access that, they can. And I think this is something that, you know, it's it's not set in stone. I think that as, you know, um, city council representatives change over, you know, I think that it's a subject that can be revisited, um, which is why I think that, you know, if you're a public health worker in one of these cute communities, it's important to have a presence and reach out and kind of provide ongoing education as needed. For sure. And so I want to go to one of the questions in the Q&A. Someone asked, has there been an increase in alcohol-related emergencies associated to cannabis crossfading as an example since legalized? This has come up a couple times on webinars. So I am curious, Jeanette, if you've seen anything around this or Rebecca, what do you think? I'm not sure what crossfading is. If someone could explain that to me. <laughs> um. Well, so it's it's when people, you know, use cannabis and alcohol at the same time, and that kind of amplifies the negative effects of both. Um, I haven't heard anything specific to that. You know, I think as cannabis has become more available, like we've seen a few different things happen with youth. So first, the perception of harm plummeted, right? Like we legalized it and in youth immediately, we're like, this isn't bad for you because it's legal. Then there's also the medical aspect too. So I think, you know, young people tend to think, well, if it has medical benefits, it can't be bad for you. Like there's no harm, right? Um, but then we have have seen an increase because there's so much high potency THC being used. We have seen an increase in emergency room visits for things like hyperemesis where people can't stop vomiting. Like it's just ongoing and they get really dehydrated and they need to seek medical attention. And that's a side effect of the cannabis use. Um, but I haven't heard, or I haven't seen any data relating to alcohol. I know that OUIs have gone up to, um, for cannabis and like kind of different municipalities, um, have expanded, you know, having, um, drug recognition experts too in law enforcement. Um, so they have noticed more people driving under the influence of cannabis, but not sure about the crossover, but with, with alcohol and cannabis. Yeah. Rebecca, do you, do you have anything to add about the OUI situation that Jeanette just flagged? Have you seen anything from municipalities on that? I have not seen anything as far as an increase in OUIs. I would, I know enforcement is a major issue for for um, municipalities, um, whether it be law enforcement enforcement or regulation enforcement, um, a lot of a lot of law enforcement tend to not want to deal with it. <laughs> so it, it's, I guess, it depends on the on where you are and the person and whether it's going to be looked into or not, because it is illegal federally, but it's legal in the state, you know, for personal use. So it's as far as it's not considered illegal anymore. Well, operating under the influence is illegal, regardless of whether, right, that's what we're talking about here is operating under the influence of cannabis anywhere is is illegal. But the, that's a concern of municipalities, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But there's <laughs> no, I guess that the, the rub is that there's no minimal limit, right? We don't have a minimal, there's no like blood alcohol limit for cannabis for driving, at least as far as I know. Right. Yeah. Which seems I don't think there's a way to, to test that limit. Yeah. Um, right. So I, before we get off of this thread, someone asked in the, in the Q and A, do you have state data on the increase in cases of that medical condition regarding vomiting and cannabis, which sounds horrible. <laughs> Um, I had not heard that before, but Jeanette, do you have any state data on that that you could share? I don't, but you you could probably get it by, you know, contacting the hospital systems. I, I mean, I'm sure they they track that. Um, but I don't I don't personally have it. I could I could look into it though. Right. So um, we have a, ch a question from someone in Ohio. They say that 
We just recently passed issue two uh, regarding cannabis as municipalities and other LHDs are exploring options and programming for cannabis education and regulation at local levels. They're encountering resistance from local small business owners looking to enter the market. Do you have any examples of successful MOUs, language, et cetera, that could be used during this period of transition as more formal policy is being developed? Rebecca, anything on your end? Uh, that question is a little tough to answer, uh, given, given I'm not sure what kind of resistance they're getting from this local business and why. Um, if they've if the municipality has opted in to allow these businesses to happen, then it should be they should be already have their ordinances and everything in place um, that would kind of dictate how that would go. So there wouldn't be an MOU necessarily, but while you're getting that all developed, um, I can see where that might be helpful if you have already opted in, but you have not got the ordinances under control. Um, so I, I don't have any, any kind of sample for that, um, but I'd be happy to look into it to see if I could find something. Yeah. If you'd be willing, Rebecca, to, to share, um, just the MMA website in the chat. I'm sure folks can dig into that and see if there are any helpful resources that they can use. Um, and Jeanette, anything on your end on that question? Um, yeah, I mean, if it's not something that's built into the ordinance and mandatory, you can't really force a business to to comply with, with education efforts. Um, but you can definitely do outreach. And, you know, I think we've done a similar thing. Like I said, Westbrook doesn't have cannabis retail, but we have done a similar outreach efforts with alcohol retailers. So we've had like a pamphlet with a lot of different helpful information. We've tried to put on trainings for responsible beverage server trainings, um, absorb that cost and try to get folks certified too. Um, but if it's not something that's mandated either on the state or local level, you can't like force anyone to do it. You just hope that, you know, they're receptive to it. Right. So back to the vomiting <laughs> issue. So someone asked who in the hospital system would be willing to provide the data that you referenced as, you know, you don't have the data right now, but maybe someone in the hospital could share it. I have no idea. Um, I mean, they have, I, I'm thinking like Maine Health has like a research department, like maybe that's, that's data they collect. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it's important to go in with, with both, you know, qualitative and quantitative data. So a lot of like these stories of, of the hyperemesis not being able to stop vomiting or things that we've heard anecdotally in the field. Um, but I, I'm sure the data does exist. And I would I would reach out to like the research and data department at like any large hospital system. Right. Thank you. Someone else asked, is there a distinction between municipalities where sales are allowed and municipalities where commercial cannabis production slash grow houses are permitted? Rebecca, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, well, if a municipality has opted in to allow the commercial cannabis grows, then they they would be allowed to happen um sales retail sales that's also something that needs needs to be opted into use but a municipality could um opt in to allow retail sales but not allow cultivation or manufacturing or testing facilities in there so it all depends on what the citizens in that municipality want to see happen thank you so I, I want to go back to something, or Jeanette, did you, were you just about to say something? No, okay. I wanted to go back to something you referenced, Rebecca, in your presentation. You you said Wyndham has regulated something, and I this is the part I didn't catch, as home businesses. Was that referring to the vertically integrated caregivers or something else? Any registered caregiver that is in their municipality, they would and they're operating out of their home, they um, tax them as a home business so that there is a, like a business licensing fee right. and they get taxed for their home business. But how do they know who those folks are? Because that list is confidential, right? For town, how do they find those people? Um, Kind of trial and error. If they uh, 
if they some some people have been very upfront and have told them that they're doing this, uh, a municipality is able to call OCP and and they can verify if some if there is a registered mm -hmm. caregiver. So if they suspect that a property is, they can verify that, um, and then they work that out with the property owner. Right, based on smell, someone just walking around. Right, I mean that's one of the it's, reasons. Yeah, honestly, I mean I. Some people may have seen those. Um, the illegal grow houses that are around popping up around me. And that's how some of them have been caught is that there's a, a very, very strong odor that just surrounds these houses. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so somebody, oh, actually follow up question on that, Rebecca. So have more towns taken advantage of that approach considering the caregivers as home businesses? You know, I'm not sure. That was, I just recently learned that that's how Wyndham handled it. And I thought that that was a great way because I, I I was kind of at a loss actually to, as to how they would regulate a caregiver, but I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, I was glad you mentioned it because it does seem like a major gap, policy gap, mm -hmm. right? That municipalities have no authority over that. For sure. Uh, yeah, so somebody asked about, or before I go to that, Jeanette, did you have anything else to add to that? discussion okay someone asked do you know whether there has been any increase in the incidence of schizophrenia since marijuana has been legalized i will if it's okay with the two of you um refer that person to the first webinar on general health impacts we had a psychiatrist uh join us for that discussion and he did talk about some of the data around schizophrenia so i will put that recording in the chat um and then i will ask a general question what do you think are the policy gaps that need to be filled moving forward, either on the state end or the municipal end? What would you like to see happen? And I, Jeanette, I know you talked about education versus advocacy. I think this is safe territory for you to weigh in. Um, but yeah, what do you think are the policy gaps that we need to fill moving forward on cannabis in Maine? You want know, to take a sec to think, and then Jeanette, you can go first. Sure. Um... I think, I mean, consistency is a big one, right? Like every single town that opts in and has an ordinance, it's a little bit different than the, the one that's bordering it that also opted in. Um, it's still, you know, we have fewer than, I think it's it's closer to like 15% of the state has opted in. Um, so really having like specific guidance on what has worked well. So in the, that 15% of folks who have opted in, what have they found to be working great for them? Like, has that prevention fund been working great? Has, um, you know, zoning limits, are those working well? Um, what are things that didn't work well for them? And what were the adjustments that they had to make? Um, that would be useful. I think, you know, if I had a magic wand, um, like state mandated responsible vendor training, um, but that's not even something we have with alcohol, right? There's only, I think, two municipalities that come to mind. I think it's Portland and Bangor that have that in their ordinance as, you know, you have to have, you have to be certified to sell alcohol, um, whether you're, you know, working at a retail store or a bar or what, what have you. So having that type of um, emphasis on education, I think, would be helpful for, for the folks who are working in those uh, in those cannabis spaces. But yeah, Rebecca, did you want to add some? I will just add that one thing, um, I think I mentioned it in my presentation was if there was more um, communication between OCP and municipalities, I think if there was a way to collaborate more without uh, exposing caregivers to any kind of adverse situation, I mean, municipalities certainly don't want to create any kind of hardship for someone who's trying to maintain a business. Um, but, the, you know, as far as their regulation and their operations, they also need to know what's going on within their borders. So there's got to be a way to work together. I think that um, is a big one. Yeah, for sure. And Jeanette, since you referenced alcohol, I was curious, are there lessons from alcohol that we should learn and, and implement for cannabis, things that we've you know learned over time, regulations we think are particularly effective, anything that you would apply to cannabis as well? I mean, I think, you know, some 
towns are really good about working with law enforcement to conduct compliance checks for alcohol. Um, I think, you know, statewide, that's a gap we have for cannabis, for sure. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, there's a lot of concerns emerging to surrounding. There's been a lot of proposed bills about consumption on site and like social clubs. Um, and I'm not, I haven't been following those very closely, so I'm not sure if they passed or not, but um, really like the health implications of, you know, if someone is using cannabis and then driving. Um, so being mindful of, of those discussions as they come up, I think is important. Um, I know we have, you know, Maine has so many breweries and I think there's, there's new ones every day that I see popping up. So I think it makes sense why people would think that type of consumption with cannabis would make sense. Um, but it really, it really doesn't. Um, so I don't know. That's necessarily... why, why do you think just for our audience, why does it not make sense? Why is it not an apples to apples comparison? I think it's a lot easier to kind of gauge, you know, when we're talking about consumption, where it's a lot easier to gauge alcohol consumption as like, you know, did someone have a safe amount? Like, are they driving or, um, you know, did they have one drink at a brewery and then they, they're fine. They know their blood alcohol level is fine and they can safely drive. I think it's difficult to put those limits to um, cannabis consumption. Like, I don't think there's a safe limit to consume and still be able to drive safely, operate a vehicle safely. Yeah. I think we're also concerned about the delayed, um, effects of cannabis use, right? Like there's no, you might take, take an edible and then several hours later think that you're good to drive, but you're not. Right. And the, the onsite consumption bills, I'll just say they, they are still, I think, technically alive in the legislature. And we also have concerns as MPHA about how those might contribute to increased, you know, OUIs, people driving under the influence. Um, Rebecca, do you have anything to share on that? Well, I know municip municipalities are also concerned with the on-site on consumption for, you know, public safety issues. That is something that they're concerned with as well. Um, yeah. I'm not sure where that's going to go. Yeah. Um, well, so that was super helpful. I'm, I'm just going to flag, I'm launching the evaluation right now for people who are on. Again, it's four questions, takes two minutes. So as we're wrapping up here, please fill that out. And I wanted to ask another clarifying question. I'm looking back at my notes, Rebecca. You said it costs the town $20,000 to opt in. What are those costs? No, uh, I'm sorry if I, I misspoke. I must have misspoke. Um, it, the the Office of Cannabis Policy is offering from the municipal opt-in fund up to $20,000 to reimburse municipalities for the cost of opting in to allow cannabis establishments in their in their towns and cities. Gotcha. Sure. And I most likely just misheard. I don't think you misspoke. It's probably my bad. Um, okay. But so for, for the cost of opting in, can you sh share a little bit more if there are municipal leaders on considering opting in, what are those kinds of costs? What's what's involved in that process? Um, it would be any kind of staff time for you know developing the ordinance, um, any attorney fees that might come up. Um, as uh, Jeanette said, if they decide that they want to have a, an education fund, then that gets added into it as well. So they just, they figure out all, what it is going to cost them to opt in and then they'll translate that into the licensing phase. I'm That's sorry, right. did I just misspeak? <laughs> Never mind. I'm sorry. My brain is just frazzled this week. <laughs> it has been a challenging, for people who have joined from out of state, it has been a challenging week in Maine. Um, massive storm wiped out much of the state infrastructure and power, including Rebecca's house. <laughs> so um, forgive us if we're not totally on the ball. But uh, in the last couple of minutes here, as we wrap up, because there are people from other states, is there any advice you would give them as their states are considering maybe legalizing or navigating this? Any advice you'd share with them? And then any final things you'd want to share just generally before we end? I mean, I would definitely look at, you know, states who are kind of like the pioneers in legalizing, like Colorado and, and lessons learned. Um, 
I think, you know, I mentioned smart approaches to marijuana or SAM. They have a lot of great data um, from like nationwide from places that cannabis has been legalized. Um, and then I, you know, having ongoing conversations, at, you know, not just between like city council members, but also really consulting public, really consulting health professionals, law enforcement. Um, I know Rebecca just spoke about some of the costs, but some of the costs are hidden too. Like, are we, you know, when we're thinking about um, accidental poisonings, like children or pets consuming things, um, if we're thinking about, you know, EMS being called to someone's house for for a child that consumed, you know, an edible um, or or the cost of law enforcement, like our municipalities having to add more staff time or hire more law enforcement um, as they've opted in, that those are all things to consider too, um, you know, managing OUIs or getting law enforcement trained to become drug recognition experts. That also has a cost. Um, so there's some things that we don't think about that, you know, there's like the hidden cost of opting in too. And someone asked Jeanette, if you can share where people can access Sam, I don't know if you have a link that's readily available to put in the chat for that. Yeah, I can find one. Thanks, Rebecca, over to you. You can have the last word. I'm sorry. What was the question again? <laughs> No worries. So we have <laughs> folks who have joined from out of state. And so for people who are, you know, in their states and they're considering legalization, anything you'd want to share with them about lessons learned here in Maine and just anything you'd want to share as we wrap up generally for the audience. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, I would say that uh, when Maine was, was just starting the whole cannabis legalization thing, we looked a lot at Colorado and California and the other states that had already opted in and were, le were working through this whole process. Um, I think Maine is doing a pretty good job right now. There's always going to be work to do, um, but definitely collaborate with people at the state level, find people in that are maybe in other municipalities your same size that may be able to help with ordinances or or just some of the costs that may come up. Like Jeanette said, there are hidden costs, absolutely. So definitely just talk to people because there's been somebody who's done it before and they can share their perspective and it's great to share those resources. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. We actually did have one last minute question. Um, have you seen, are you aware of municipalities limiting the form in which cannabis is used? And they were talking about, you know, gummies and edibles being a concern for accidental youth exposure. <clears throat> I no. believe, sorry, go ahead. Oh, um, I was just gonna say, not necessarily the form. I haven't seen anyone saying like you can't sell edibles, but I've seen them really be um, particular about the packaging and how it's presented. So if it's a gummy, you know, it doesn't look like a teddy bear. It's just like a square gummy. Um, things, you know, to make it less appealing. Um, you know, there's restrictions on advertising, um, restrictions on you know, the labeling, like we talked about earlier, really emphasizing that, you know, the product contains THC. But it, again, if it's a child that doesn't, it's, it's too young to even read and just see something that's like a cookie or a brownie, um, even if it doesn't, it's not in the shape of, you know, a cartoon character, um, they still could get into it. So. Right. Anything to add on that, Rebecca? No, she did a great job. Yeah. Well, I think you both did a great job and we can wrap up here and I'll just say thank you so much to, to our speakers and thank you to folks who joined the series, especially if you joined all four of them. I hope you found it useful. We'll have all the recordings online on uh, MPHA's YouTube, web, uh, YouTube page. So check them out there. And thanks again. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Yeah, bye, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.